Podcast, Sunday at 9 on BBC TV. The news updates now on BBC One with Sophie Rayworth. Good morning. Tony Blair has addressed a special meeting of the Cabinet to tell his colleagues when he's standing down. The Cabinet meeting broke up within the last hour. Mr Blair has now left Downing Street and is travelling to his constituency in Sedgefield to make a public announcement. Mr Blair remains leader of the Labour Party and Prime Minister until his successor is chosen. The party's executive committee is expected to meet on Sunday to set the timetable to appoint his successor. That's virtually certain to be the Chancellor Gordon Brown. He paid tribute to him at this morning's cabinet meeting. There's a spirit of tremendous teamwork and quite a lot of uh, laughter as well because Tony cracked a few jokes. Uh, he didn't want uh, any great ceremony made about it. It's, it's not like that. But Gordon Brown did pay a fulsome tribute and that was... as very much appreciated by all of us. Well, there's continuing coverage of Tony Blair's announcement that he is to stand down on BBC News 24 throughout the morning. And there is a special programme here on BBC One starting at a quarter to 12. Quick look at the weather. Generally cloudy over Scotland and southern England with rain, which will be heavy at times. Sunny spells and a scattering of showers elsewhere. That's it. More here on BBC One at a quarter to 12. Bye-bye. The one to watch tonight. Sam is worried about it. It's not like we're in a relationship or anything. Yes, you are. Mother and father. Holby City at 8 on BBC One. We don't want to disappoint ladies. Do I lie? No. No, because that's awful, isn't it? Mm. Should I stumble again more often? Yeah. A change to the daytime schedule on BBC One now, Hugh Edwards presents a BBC News Special. A very good morning to you from Westminster for this BBC News Special on the day Tony Blair announces his plans to resign as Labour leader and, of course, as Prime Minister. Now, he told the Cabinet of his intentions this morning since then, He's flown up to Sedgefield, to his constituency, to make the formal announcement, which we are expecting, well, in the next ten minutes or so. But um, uh, as you'll see, if we show you the scene in Sedgefield right now, uh, it's a scene where people are getting quite excited and looking forward to the announcement and exactly what Tony Blair has to say inside Trimden Labour Club in his constituency in Sedgefield, the constituency he's represented, the people he's been part of their community for, for well, since 1983, when he was first elected to Parliament. This is where Mr Blair has decided to make the announcement, long-awaited announcement, the announcement that he signalled he would be making before the last general election, before 2005, and, of course, there's been a lot of controversy about whether he was right to say so far in advance uh, that he wouldn't be serving um, a fourth term as Labour Prime Minister, but he's already broken several records on the way and, of course, he has a decade of power uh, under his belt already. And uh, that's the scene. That's where the announcement will come in a few minutes' time, which gives me time to just explain to you what's gone on this morning already. If you haven't been watching our coverage, well, Mr Blair held an early morning Cabinet meeting and uh, he told the Cabinet there that uh, this morning's announcement would be coming and then he left in a great big cavalcade along Whitehall and uh, went along to an RAF base, RAF Northolt, where he, he then was uh, preparing to fly up to County Durham, to, to Sedgefield, and uh, to make the announcement there. So a very, very important day, not just for Mr Blair, if I may say so, but for the Labour Party and the country, uh, because it signals, of course, that we are entering a brand new political age and a brand new political era. And we'll have lots, lots of talk about that during the course of the day. A very warm reception for Mr Blair when he arrived outside Trimden Labour Club within the past uh, half hour, 45 minutes or so. Uh, scenes where he was uh, greeted there with lots of warm applause. And uh, as John Sopel was saying earlier, and viewers on BBC One may well have been watching News 24 earlier, lots of warm applause reminiscent of that day on the 1st of May 1997 when Mr Blair 
arrived in Downing Street to be greeted uh, warmly there on that first day of office. So that's the arrival. That's uh, what's happened already. And this is the scene live inside the Labour Club in Trimden, where Mr Blair's held so many constituency surgeries and met so many people over the years. And, uh, a very big crowd gathered for the announcement there. We'll be talking to one or two of Mr Blair's closest colleagues uh, in the next few minutes or so as we await the announcement. But our man John Sopel is in Trimden. Let's join John now for the latest there. Hugh, thank you very much. Yes, great excitement here among the Labour Party uh, supporters of Tony Blair. Because it was here, of course, in Trimden Labour Club in 1994, after the death of John Smith, that Tony Blair launched his bid to become Labour leader. Here, of course, that he returned on the night in 1997, when he realised that he had won a landslide majority. And it is here that he's returned today to draw the curtain down on his premiership a decade on from uh, taking power. And as we soon can see inside there now, the crowds of supporters, they're not thinking about Iraq today, they're not thinking about the cash for peerages, they're, not, they're putting aside the problems that have beset uh, Tony Blair's uh, premiership, but instead wanting to concentrate on the sort of things that Tony Blair wants to talk about for his legacy, the record investment in the health service, the low inflation, the low interest rates, the, uh, the fact that unemployment has remained low, that the economy has remained stable through this decade of Labour in power, and also celebrating the first Labour leader ever to win uh, three terms in office. Tony Blair is due on the stage there uh, very shortly. They've been playing the music of Doreen. Things can only get better. And anyone who uh, remembers the 1997 general election will surely uh, remember that song which seemed to accompany uh, Labour anywhere uh, that it went. I'm joined here just on our little patch of grass across the street uh, from uh, the Trimden Labour Club by our political correspondent uh, James uh, Landale. James, a celebratory atmosphere inside there, worth pointing out as well, the odd few protesters out here, so that the legacy isn't entirely as Tony Blair would wish it framed. It's not. Um, before I answer that question, can I just give you a little bit of breaking news? I've just been told that the Prime Minister will give us a date uh, in his speech when he addresses us shortly, but that the date of his... It'll be the debate date of his departure from Downing Street, not necessarily the date when Gordon Brown actually takes over as Prime Minister. And so that might be a little bit earlier than we're all expecting on, in all the schedules that we've got all planned. But as you say, the legacy issue, it's going to be clearly a mixed one. The voters have clearly made up their minds on how they view the Labour Party. We saw the results... Uh, that were quite poor for Labour last week. But at the same time, the polls show that the Prime Minister individually, 60% of people say, we think he's a good, pri good Prime Minister. And interestingly, here in Sedgefield, you know, you can talk about Labour's problems in the rest of the country, and they are serious, in, particularly in the south of England, where Labour did so well in 97. Here, in one of the, one of the wards in Sedgefield, Labour stood and the Conservative candidate got no votes. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are always going to be core... Uh, Places where the, the, uh, the Labour Party remains as strong as ever, regardless of what happens here, is one of them. The interesting question is, what will happen to this part of the world when the Prime Minister leaves? OK, James, thank you very much indeed. Well, let's just dwell on those pictures inside the hall there, because, uh, Hugh, I think it may still be a little while uh, yet before Tony Blair uh, gets to his feet, but I think they are all very much... Uh, well, look at them, dancing. It's not even lunchtime yet, and people are dancing. Back to you. John, may the dance continue. We'll be back to see what happens when uh, Mr Blair appears. If you've just joined us, it's a BBC News special from Westminster and from Sedgefield in County Durham because this is the day that Tony Blair will be announcing his plans to leave office, to resign as Labour leader and to resign as Prime Minister. We're expecting him to spell out some of the details. And as James Landell hinted, there may be even a date for when we'll have a new Prime Minister in Downing Street, in all likelihood, Gordon Brown. Now, what on earth happened at the Cabinet this morning? But that's pretty intriguing, isn't it? What was the response around that Cabinet table when Mr Blair told ministers? We'll be talking about that, but straight back to Sedgefield because I think that the first guests are arriving ahead of the Prime Minister, including, of course, Sherry Blair, who's uh, arrived in the Trimden Labour Club to take her place in the crowd with members of the family and getting an equally warm reception. And uh, as uh, Cherie Blair takes her, takes her place and uh, 
acknowledges lots of the members there in the audience. I think I've got time to pick up again on the theme of the Cabinet, uh, because, of course, Mr Blair told the Cabinet this morning that he was going to be doing this today. Um, and David Miliband and Hazel Bleers, two Cabinet members with an interest in all of this, have been describing what was said. Here they are. I don't think it was a great shock. I mean, the detective work of the BBC had given us some advance warning that this might be happening. Uh, the Prime Minister cut the ice very well, as he often does by telling a joke at his own expense, and uh, Gordon paid a very handsome tribute to the Prime Minister. And so um, the world goes on, business goes on, government goes on. Well, I think it, it was a, a, a bittersweet moment, really. Um, it felt a, a little bit like 1997, walking up Downing Street, a lovely sunny morning. Um, but um, crowds. Well, there are lots of crowds of photographers, but uh, not, not crowds of real people, unfortunately. Not that photographers are not real people. Um, but, but also there was um, clearly the, the fact that the Prime Minister is going to be around um, for you know, the next few cabinets. So um, it wasn't a big dramatic thing today. Hazel Blears and David Miliband just giving us a flavour of the uh, atmosphere around the Cabinet table this morning. A very, very big moment for this Cabinet, of course. They've been expecting the announcement, but, you know, when the Prime Minister acknowledges that this is the day, well, it's a sobering moment for them because, of course, for some of them, it also signals the end of their time in Cabinet too, but I suspect not for David Miliband and uh, some of the other members there. As you can see, it's a bit of a party atmosphere in Sedgefield, in County Durham, as they wait for the Prime Minister to turn up. And while we wait, we won't miss a word of it, by the way, we'll be straight away, there straight away when, when the Prime Minister appears. I'm joined by Lord Gould, Philip Gould, who for many years was letting Mr Blair know every nuance of public opinion, one of our foremost experts on public opinion and the trends and all the complexities of that. Philip, thanks for joining us. Um, pleasure for you. Your, your, your reflections, first of all, on, on the fact that today is the day. Well, it's a strange day. It's a day of sadness, of course, sadness for me personally, but it's also a day of excitement. I, I feel an excitement around and about. Uh, and I think, really, this is the first time that people have actually thought that like, Tony Blair is going. And I think this is a big shock. And I think you've had a lot of negativity or some negativity recently, but now I think the reassessment begins and you'll begin to feel now the positive mood uh, come back towards the Prime Minister. He's anyway a hugely paradoxical figure. I mean, there are some people who can't stand him at any price. A lot of people the opposite. He provokes a contradictory response, and that's what makes, I think, a truly big and great Prime Minister, which is what he is. And I think people now are thinking, God, he's going. And what do I really think about it? And I think the response is going to be overwhelmingly positive. Well, we're going to have that speech in a minute, Philip, I'm told, and we'll be there straight away. Just in that minute, then, tell us what you expect him to be wanting to say in this announcement today. Well, I think he's going to say what he's doing, and I think he's going to say what he's done as Prime Minister, and I think he's going to speak personally to the, to the people of Britain, because this is a big, big moment for him. A big Prime Minister leaving after a long, long time. And I think it's going to be a very important moment for him and for Britain too. And, what, and what's the message he wants to leave with people today of all days? that this guy's worked his balls off for the British people for the last 10 years and he's on their side and he's been on their side and the people have always been the boss. How long will you have prepared this statement for? I imagine he would have left it quite late. Do you think so? Yeah. But it's really important and really matters, I mean, sometimes he must, late. He must have been thinking ahead to this moment for months, really. Well, thinking about it for a long time, but writing last, I think. Writing late. I think, for him, this is a very, very large moment. Not just for him, but for the British people. And, he needs to get it right. He wants to get it right. And, and will it be all him? Will people have inputted ideas? He will have written every word of it. As indeed he has for almost all of his most recent um, important speeches. He'll write every word of this. This is him speaking directly to the British people he's been serving for this last 10 years. And I think it will be very much his statement on his terms, in his words. Philip, stay with us. Let's just uh, have a quick look to see what's going on there because uh, we've been on the pictures. We expect John Burton, uh, Mr Blair's long-standing agent and uh, soulmate in Trimden, to be opening the session. And uh, he'll be making the introductory remarks. Uh, he's the gentleman with the, the frizzy white hair and uh, a very familiar figure and has been a, uh, a great help to lots of political journalists over the years. And uh, he'll be making the initial announcement. And after that, and after that, we'll be getting the, uh, 
the statement by Mr Blair himself. And Philip Gould here still with me looking at these pictures. A bit of a party atmosphere, Philip. And, it, is, um, it is. I think it's going to be like that today. It's going to be a, a blending of sadness and excitement. And I mean, you said, I think, there's a little bit of a feel of 1997 about it. And that's true. I mean, this uh, is... Uh, it's a moment uh, it's a moment both of sadness and of excitement and i think that will come through all of the day cuz i just don't think people were expecting it oh, oh maybe it will happen and now it's happened i think it's going to be a big big shock and tomorrow people are going to be thinking god that was a big moment and um, it's going to be partly festive and partly uh, rather mournful uh, we heard alan milburn earlier saying today yet again that he thought it had been a mistake to signal that this would come and that this strategy was the one that he'd embarked on. Um, did you share those doubts? No, I don't think so. I think, really, there wasn't much else he could do. I mean, I, it's quite difficult, really, to... I mean, what, what everyone wanted to do was to avoid Margaret Thatcher. We just wanted to, to avoid and on and on and on and on, and it seemed a sensible thing to do. There were disadvantages with it, but the alternative would have had disadvantages too. I think it's worked out pretty well. I think he's left at pretty much uh, the right time, and I think that, as time passes, it will look much, much better than it does or has done in recent months. I think people will feel, yeah, he got it about right. Do you think Gordon Brown's watching this coverage? I imagine he is, but I think uh, uh, Giers and Tony Blair are watching his coverage on Friday. And what do you expect Mr Brown's thoughts to be today? I think also it's a big and moving moment for him. I mean, I have been have had the odd conversation with him recently, and I think he does feel, yeah, it's here, it's coming, and it's a very, very big responsibility for him and one he takes very seriously. I think... I think it's a, it's, if it's big for Tony today, it's big for Gordon uh, as he moves on to this next stage of his life. And I think it is a very big thing, and I think he will do it extremely well. I think he is ready for it, he's hungry for it, and I, I think people will be surprised how, how well he does. Well, the big, the big question, of course, as we look at this and the closing of the Blair era, the big question, especially as far as public opinion is concerned, is to what extent Gordon Brown can present himself, Philip, as, as, as a new man. Look, what... Well, these two guys, I mean, they, I mean, I remember looking back 20 years, 15 years, when they started in politics, you know, going to their room at a conference hotel and there'd be paper all over the place and t Tony Blair would be writing stuff and Gordon Brown would be sort of, you know, typing stuff and this whole surge of energy would come through. And these two guys, they created new Labour uh, between them. And then it came to, it fell to the Prime Minister Tony Blair to lead the nation for 10 years. But this guy is not going to throw that away. He's going to be new Labour, but he will do it in his own terms, in his own way, and with his own particular uh, focus, and that's how it should be. So I think that, that if anyone can follow Tony Blair as Gordon Brown. I mean, I'm interested, and certainly given your expertise and the, the way that you, know, you understand the, the twists and turns of public opinion, you know, how on earth do you get to a position where voters look at Gordon Brown later this week and say, Yes, I mean, this no. represents a fresh start. What's going to happen is that they're going to look at him afresh. I mean, they've seen him as a Chancellor, and when he becomes Prime Minister, they're going to think, oh, God, because they weren't probably expecting that, really. They weren't expecting Tony going. They don't really expect Gordon arriving. They'll look at him afresh, and they will give him every single chance. And look, be honest, he's a different guy to Tony Blair. He embodies change. He has changed. So there will, there will be a lot of change there as well as uh, continuity. I mean, but I, I'm confident he'll be given every fair chance by the British public. And, and when you talk of change, are you talking about changes of you know, style, which are clear, changes of the way that uh, he wants to run his government, that'll be apparent, but surely not big changes of policy, because he's been allied to these big policies. Well, it, it, what he needs to do is to balance continuity and change. And I think he is one of the... Well, he, he and Tony created New Labour. He will continue New Labour, but he will do it in his own terms. And that is the right thing for him. Uh, Big, ben is, Big Ben is striking midday, Philip. John Burton is going to the podium. Let's join him. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, friends. Um, this club, I don't know whether you realise, was a working men's club before it became a Labour club and it wasn't doing very well, and so they took women onto the committee. <laughs> that is true. And one of them was a gorgeous Labour Party supporter and a hard worker, Maisie Tones, and it's her funeral now taking place. 
and the family are rather amazed at the media turnout for Macy's <laughs> film. <laughs> And uh, I thought when I, when I was organising this, you know, I said to Paul, and the media will want to use the bar. She says, but Maisie's friends are meeting in the bar afterwards, so the media will have to compete with Maisie's friends. <laughs> but it's lovely. She'll be very, she'll be very honoured. Well, it's a special day. It's a strange day for me, and I'm sure for a lot of you. But it's one not of sadness, but it's one of happiness and we should be looking at what's taken place over the last 10 years, and we should be glad that certainly this village and this constituency and the country has improved so much over the last 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> I've been giving a list over the last few days, you know, to all the media, so I'll not start now, otherwise there'll be nothing to say. So I'll get off now and introduce you to our local MP, Tony Byrne. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's a, um, it's a great privilege to be here with you again today and to, to thank all of you too for, for such a wonderful and, and warm welcome and especially uh, Maureen, and, Ma uh, Maureen and her friends who gave me such a wonderful welcome. The only, the only thing is they, she was kind of, when I was coming in four more years and I was saying, Maureen, that's not our message for today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd just like to say uh, also, if, if I might, just a, a special word of thanks to, to John Burton. Um, John, has, John has been my agent here for many years now. Um, he's still the, the best political advisor that, that I've got. He's, uh, he's all the years I've known him, he's been steadfast in his loyalty to me, to the Labour Party, uh, and to Sunderland Football Club, not necessarily in that order. Uh, <laughs> and we won't get into that. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's been, my, it's been my great good fortune at certain um, points in my life to meet exceptional people, and he is one very exceptional person. Um, and also, if I may refer to another exceptional person, who is my wife, friend, and partner, Cherie. And the children, of course, you and Nikki and Catherine and, and Leo, who make me never forget my failings, uh, <laughs> but give me great love and support. So, I've, uh, I've come back here to Sedgefield, to my constituency, where my political journey began and where it's fitting that it should end. Today, I announce my decision to stand down from the leadership of the Labour Party. The party will now select a new leader on the 27th of June, I will tender my resignation from the Office of Prime Minister to the Queen. <coughs> I've been Prime Minister of this country for just over 10 years. In this job, in the world of today, I think that's long enough for me, but more especially for the country. And sometimes, the only way you conquer the pull of power is to set it down. It's, um, it's difficult, in a way, to know how to, to make this speech. There's obviously judgments to be made on my premiership, and in the end, that is for, for you, the people, to make. I can only describe what I think has been 
done over these last 10 years, and perhaps more important, why I tried to do it. And I never quite uh, put it in this, this way before. I was born almost a decade after the Second World War. I was a young man in the social revolution of the 60s and 70s. I reached political maturity as the Cold War was ending and the world was going through a political and an economic and a technological revolution. And I looked at my own country, a great country, wonderful history, magnificent traditions, proud of its past, but strangely uncertain of its future, uncertain about the future, almost old-fashioned. And all that was, was curiously symbolized, you know, in the politics of the time. Y you, you had choices. You stood for individual aspiration or, and getting on in life, or social compassion and helping others. You were liberal in your values, or conservative. You believed in the power of the state or the efforts of the individual. Spending more money on the public realm was the answer or it was the problem. And none of it made sense to me. It was 20th century ideology in a world approaching a new millennium. Of course, people want the best for themselves and their families. But in an age where human capital is a nation's greatest asset, they also know it's just and sensible to extend opportunities, to develop the potential to succeed for all our people, not just an elite at the top. And people today are open-minded about race and sexuality. They're averse to prejudice and yet deeply, rightly conservative with a small c when it comes to good manners respect for others, treating people courteously. They acknowledge the need for the state and the responsibility of the individual. And they know spending money on our public services matters, and they know it's not enough. How they are run and organized matters too. So 1997 was a moment for a new beginning, the sweeping away of all the detritus of the past. And expectations were so high. Too high, probably. Too high in a way for either of us. And now in 2007, you can easily point to the challenges or the things that are wrong or the grievances that fester. But go back to 1997. Think back. No, really, think back. Think about your own living standards then, in May 1997, and now. Visit your local school, any of them around here or anywhere in modern Britain. Ask when you last had to wait a year or more on a hospital waiting list or heard of pensioners freezing to death in the winter, unable to heat their homes. There is only one government since 1945 that can say all of the following. More jobs, fewer unemployed, better health and education results, lower crime and economic growth in every quarter. Only one government, this one. But we don't need statistics. There's something bigger than what can be measured in waiting lists or GCSE results or the latest crime or jobs figures. Look at the British economy at ease with globalization. London, the world's financial center. Visit our great cities in this country and compare them with 10 years ago. No country attracts overseas investment like we do. And think about the culture of Britain in the year 2007. I don't just mean our arts that are thriving, I mean our values. The minimum wage, paid holidays as a right, 
amongst the best maternity pay and leave today in Europe. Equality for gay people. Or look at the debates that reverberate around the world today. The global movement to support Africa in its struggle against poverty. Climate change. The fight against terrorism. Britain is not a follower today. Britain is a leader. gets the essential characteristic of today's world, its interdependence. This is a country today that for all its faults, for all the myriad of unresolved problems and fresh challenges, it is a country comfortable in the 21st century, at home in its own skin, able not just to be proud of its past, but also confident of its future. You know, I don't think Northern Ireland would have been changed unless Britain had changed. Or the Olympics won if we were still the Britain of 1997. And as for my own leadership, throughout these 10 years, where the predictable has competed with the utterly unpredicted, right at the outset, one thing was clear to me. Without the Labour Party allowing me to lead it, nothing could ever have been done. But I also knew my duty was to put the country first. That much was obvious to me when just under 13 years ago, I became Labour's leader. <clears throat> what I had to learn, however, as Prime Minister, was what putting the country first really meant. Decision making is hard. You know, everyone always says in politics, listen to the people. And the trouble is, is you find they don't always agree. <laughs> and when you're in opposition, you meet this group and they say, why can't you do this? And you say, it's a really good question. Thank you. And they go away and say, it's great. He really listened. And then you meet that other group and they say, why can't you do that? And you say, it's a really good question. Thank you. And they go away happy that you listened. In government, you have to give the answer. Not an answer, the answer. And in time, you realize that putting the country first doesn't mean doing the right thing according to conventional wisdom or the prevailing consensus or the latest snapshot of opinion. It means doing what you genuinely believe to be right that your duty as Prime Minister is to act according to your conviction. And all of that can get contorted so that people think that you act according to some messianic zeal. Doubt, hesitation, reflection, consideration, reconsideration, these are all the good companions of proper decision making. But the ultimate obligation is to decide. And sometimes the decisions are accepted quite quickly. Bank of England independence was one which gave us our economic stability. Sometimes like tuition fees or trying to break up old monolithic public services. The changes are deeply controversial, hellish hard to do. But you can see you are moving with the grain of change around the world. And sometimes like with Europe, where I believe Britain should keep its position strong. You know you're fighting opinion, but you're kind of content with doing so. And sometimes, as with the completely unexpected, you are alone with your own instinct. In Sierra Leone, and to stop ethnic cleansing in Kosovo, I took the decision to make our country one that intervened, that did not pass by or keep out of the thick of it. And then came the utterly unanticipated and dramatic September the 11th, 2001, and the death of 3,000 or more on the streets of New York. 
And I decided we should stand shoulder to shoulder with our oldest ally. And I did so out of belief. And so Afghanistan, and then Iraq. The latter, bitterly controversial. And removing Saddam and his sons from power, as with removing the Taliban, was over with relative ease. But the blowback since, from global terrorism and those elements that support it, has been fierce and unrelenting and costly. And for many, it simply isn't and can't be worth it. For me, I think we must see it through. They, the terrorists who threaten us here and around the world, will never give up if we give up. It is a test of will and of belief, and we can't fail it. So, some things I knew I would be dealing with, some I thought I might be, some never occurred to me or to you on that morning of the 2nd of May, 1997, when I came into Downing Street for the first time. Great expectations. Not fulfilled in every part for sure. Occasionally, people say, as I said earlier, the expectations were too high. You should have lowered them. But to be frank, I would not have wanted it any other way. I was and remain as a person and as a prime minister an optimist. Politics may be the art of the possible, but at least in life, give the impossible a go. So, of course, the visions are painted in the colours of the rainbow and the reality is sketched in the duller tones of black and white and grey. But I ask you to accept one thing. Hand on heart, I did what I thought was right. I may... I may have been wrong, that's your call. But believe one thing, if nothing else, I did what I thought was right for our country. And I came into office with high hopes for Britain's future, and you know, I leave it with even higher hopes for Britain's future. This is a country that can today be excited by the opportunities, not constantly fretful of the dangers. And people say to me, it's a tough job. Not really. A tough life is the life led by the young severely disabled children and their parents who visited me in Parliament the other week. Tough as the life my dad had, his whole career cut short at the age of 40 by a stroke. Actually, I've been very lucky and very blessed. And this country is a blessed nation. The British are special. The world knows it. In our innermost thoughts, we know it. This is the greatest nation on earth. So it has been an honour to serve it. I give my thanks to you, the British people, for the times that I've succeeded, and my apologies to you for the times I've fallen short. But good luck.
Tony Blair in Sedgefield, announcing the end of his leadership of the Labour Party and the end of his premiership. The formal end will come on the 27th of June this year when he will tender his resignation to the Queen after the election of his successor, widely expected to be the Chancellor Gordon Brown. Mr Blair chosen to speak to his own people, to his constituents and party friends and family in Sedgefield, said he'd been very lucky to have led the greatest nation on earth, a blessed nation. He thanked the British people for their support over the past decade and acknowledged that he'd fallen short at times and apologised for that. Great expectations, as he put it, not fulfilled in every part, for sure. But much of the address was given over to a consistent justification of decisions he'd made in some very tricky areas, not least on Iraq and the aftermath of September the 11th, 2001. He said, hand on heart, I did what I thought was right for the country. So the statement in Sedgefield is over, and watching that with me here is someone who knows a good deal about the Labour Party, for sure. That's Lord Kinnock, Neil Kinnock, watching that with me. Lord Kinnock, what did you make of it? Well, I view today, and indeed watch Tony with the, a mixture of sadness at his going and anticipation of what comes next that will develop from the very, very strong platform that he's created with his colleagues over the last 10 years. Hand on heart, he said, I've done my best for the country. He's acknowledging pretty openly that out there in the country there are millions of people who disagree with him fundamentally on some things. He's a conscientious man, he's a devout man, and however much people disagree, I have disagreed with him, you're absolutely certain that he has thought in depth about an issue, consulted about it, and come to a firm conclusion that's based on rationality and that is what gives him the uh, incessant willingness to continue to press. The best instance of that is actually Northern Ireland but there are many many others. Um, understandably he was very emotional at the end of that statement and there'll be lots of people in the room who are emotional too. Mm. He chose to end on, on a double message didn't he? Thank you for your support. I think I got lots of things right, but I apologise when I fell short. Um, why did he end on that? Because of his normality. I think it's one of the greatest attributes of dominating and distinguished figures like Tony Blair, that they do have an innermost humanity and humility. And it wasn't any false declaration of humbleness. It's really what he means, and he said it as he feels it. Um, do you and other very senior people in the party fully agree with him that, you know, he leaves the country in a far better state than when he found it? I certainly do. Uh, looking at the stability in the British economy, low inflation, continued good economic performance, record investment by a very, very, very long stretch in health, education, trying to combat family poverty and much else. Yes, this is a better country in which to live. And as Tony said himself, the remarkable changes in 10 years in temperament, in culture, in style, levels of tolerance of difference in our country that I thought we'd wait a lot longer to see. I, I'm very proud of that. And I think that while government isn't totally responsible for that, government and its aspirations and works must be a strong contributing factor. I think that they have been. Lord Kinnock, good to have your company today. Thank you, Thank you very much. Lord Kinnock there, uh, Neil Kinnock, um, of course, the former Labour leader, and uh, with his perspective, very special perspective on the Blair years. Let's go back to Sedgefield because uh, our man John Sopel is uh, keeping an eye on things there for us and uh, talking to some of those who've been enjoying the address today. John, over to you. 
Hugh, thank you very much. Yes, some wiping a tear from their eyes. We can see there on the screen there, having listened uh, to Tony Blair's address, saying there are some things he got right and he apologises for the areas where he came short. And if you can hear a lot of noise in the background, those are anti-war protesters. So it was almost as if to kind of highlight the legacy. Well, let's talk to our political editor, uh, Nick Robinson, who was listening to that. Nick, what did you make of it? Well, it was a sort of attempt at a humble tone, wasn't it? There was no great strident list of achievements. And yet when he said, and he said it repeatedly, look, I apologise for those things I got wrong, he didn't tell you any he got wrong. He didn't take the opportunity to say, well, this was a mistake and that was. In fact, what he asked for was understanding and almost forgiveness. I did what I did because I believed it. You might think it was wrong, but don't think I did it for the wrong motives. Yes, it was almost like you could fill in the dots at certain points in that speech where he wouldn't say what it was, but you felt, oh, well, that must be a reference to Iraq or that must be a reference to, I don't know, some of the other things that have beset his leadership. Once again, I think this was a plea for understanding. We used to joke that he was trust me, Tony. In a way, his last speech, his speech uh, leaving this office is to say, trust me, you were right when you trusted me. I am sincere. I do mean what I say. And even on those things that you're violently cross with me about or disappointed, it wasn't because my motives were wrong, I made some mistakes. So he admitted that expectations had been too high and he admitted that there'd been disappointment, but he didn't spell any of them out. What he did say is, just remember a couple of things. Remember that unemployment is down, that crime is down, a list, he said, that no other government could have produced. And it did underline again, what a communicator he is. Love him or loathe him. He's an extraordinary communicator, isn't he? I mean, look at this whole event, really, John. He's already said goodbye to the Labour Party. He's already told the country he's going. It was the worst-kept secret in politics. Uh, not the exact day, to be fair. We did at least learn that today, but the fact he'd be gone by the end of June. He could have simply written a quick letter to the chairman of the National Executive Committee of the Labour Party and said, by the way, organise an election because I'm off soon. Not Tony Blair. He flies up from London. He's amongst those people who love him best, who will cry, who will cheer at all the right moments. And he gives an emotional plea saying, look, I did it for you. OK, Nick Robinson, thank you very much indeed. And the sirens you can hear there are the Sedgefield against the war protesters. Not surprisingly, they're not in Trimden Labour Club. It is the people who are fans of Tony Blair who have gathered there to listen to his farewell speech. Hugh, back to you on College Green. John, thank you very much. Very clear sirens too. Um, listening to that, with me is the Cabinet Minister, Alan Johnson. Thanks for joining us, Alan, uh, once again. Um, very emotional address by Mr Blair. Went through lots of policy areas and yet came to the end and said, look, where I've failed, I'm sorry. Um, is it what you expected? It is. I mean, there's a con he's a consummate politician. He's supreme in his powers of persuasion and communication. But he's also a thoroughly decent and courteous human being without an ounce of pomposity in his body. So I think that's typical Tony. And at the Cabinet, he was very keen to avoid any fuss this morning. He's obviously thought about those words just in the last half an hour, you know, it's like a journalist working to a deadline. And it was all the more genuine for that, I think. What was the message he gave you as Cabinet Ministers? Well, I think that he's laid a foundation over the last 10 years, that things have changed and they've changed for the better in the last 10 years. Now it's time to move to a new phase of Labour in power, but we should recognise our achievements and we should ensure that we entrench those achievements uh, for the future, because this is I really believe this, a better country than we found in 1997. Well, you're one of those who's going to be enthusiastically campaigning for a formal position as um, maybe Gordon Brown's deputy. What is the message that you're going to be taking to Labour's own members? Well, it is renewal, not reversal. You know, there's no going back to the old days, whatever, some mythical past when uh, Labour didn't have that coalition of aspirants and a disadvantage. We've changed that. We've managed to marry up uh, economic justice with a strong economy, social justice with a strong economy, we mustn't lose that. We must maintain that because that's very much part of the trust between this government and the British people. And just, just finally, Alan, uh, when Mr Blair there went through some of the big controversies, including Iraq, just basically wanted to say hand on heart, I did what I thought was right. He's still acknowledging that there are millions out there who simply don't agree with him. That's right, and he did. And of course, unlike every previous war, Parliament took a vote on that decision and we all have to think uh, those that were there in 2003 and you know Tony's big enough to say that it, he recognizes not everything he's done has been absolutely right and I think that's a sign of his great modesty. Mr Johnson thank you very much.
There'll be more analysis and reaction uh, in the daily politics uh, on BBC Do in just a few minutes' time and ongoing coverage, of course, on BBC News 24. But for now, from Westminster, this BBC News special. Thanks for watching and goodbye. This afternoon, Boyd's torn between two women in Neighbours at 1.40, Michelle's mum makes a colourful appearance in Doctors at 5 past 2, and Jessica comes into the 21st century in Murder, She Wrote at 2.35 on BBC One.